Celesque was surprised to see a ship pop up on their screens. Their intel had said that this sector had no enemy ships and was largely ignored by all parties in the conflict. That is until Escher High Command decided that an ignored sector was the perfect place for an exploratory military expedition. Celeste wasn't sure who had that brilliant idea. The system was boring. There was a reason no one paid any attention to it. No raw materials that weren't in abundance elsewhere. No strategic value, no sapient life forms. Only one planet with a bit of algae goo. Still, Escher had sent three cruisers to explore the system and assess whether they should build a base here. Maybe a secret research base? A few hours after their jump, that ship popped up on their screens. From the readout, it was clear that the ship had seen them and was headed their way at top speed. What kind of ship are we looking at, Lieutenant? Celeste asked their sensor tech. After studying the readouts for a moment, Lieutenant Sarwin replied, Human. Putting out quite a heat signature for its size, as it's smaller than any of our ships. Ha! That heat signature is probably because those backwards apes are still using 50-year-old designs. Celeste clicked their mandibles, laughing. The rest of the bridge crew joined in. Humans had only been on the intergalactic scene for a few generations, but they had never lost their unofficial status as something of a joke. Which of our ships is best positioned to intercept? Celeste asked their navigator. After a quick readout of the telemetries, the navigator reported that their own ship was best suited to intercept. All right, move us into position. Ready the long lance. The human ship continued its direct approach at high speed. As it got closer, the sensor tech was able to discern more of the ship. It's quite small. Their shields are at full power, and it appears they have slapped various weapons pods onto the outer hull. Their tech ended incredulously. Everyone on the bridge laughed again. Ship in range within three minutes. Celeste waited impatiently. The humans had to see that they were outgunned by merely one of their ships, let alone three. In spite of their dumpy old rust bucket of a ship, Celeste was a little bit nervous as they always were before an engagement. Anything could happen, especially the unexpected. Plans never worked flawlessly. Inform the other two cruisers to take up supporting positions, Celeste told their communications officer. The officer raised their eyelid in surprise yet did as they were told. Two flashes, brighter than any sun, lit up the view screen. The cruiser shook from one side to the next. Red lights flashed in alarm. Everything turned from one moment to the next to chaos. Fire. What happened? Report, Celeste shouted in a panic. The human ship appears to have fired two long-range energy weapons, the sensor tech shouted. Our main cannons have been knocked offline, but our secondary array is engaging. At that moment, a sound started and grew louder and louder until it became a shriek. More red lights flashed. Explosions from the hull crowded the view screen. Electric arrays in the bridge blew. Celeste, second in command, punched the button for the escape pod on the captain's chair. As Celeste was wrapped into the escape cocoon, the tumult of the bridge receded. But that horrible, dreadful noise that Celeste had heard was still there. In the background, they knew it would haunt their nightmares. A human ship dropped out of FTL and sent a docking and repair request. Arcanus, the docking master, puffed with annoyance. Another human ship, taking up valuable space and resources. Didn't these barely evolved apes know that the Starbase had important Gelgian battlecruisers in need of repair? No one could spare time for the humans' clunky old junkers, but the fleet was nothing if not fanatical about tradition, which meant that humans had not yet joined its ranks. Instead, they just did their own thing as part of the Galactic Confederation, it meant they didn't have access to the newest technology, but it also kept them out of everyone else's business. When the war started, and the human government had volunteered their soldiers, the response had mostly been one of humor and exasperation. So, the fleet assigned humanity basic tasks and out-of-the-way duties. And now this bucket of bolts was coming into Arcanist Starbase and, albeit politely, she had to grant them that, requesting help. She sighed and sent a request asking what they would need. A short moment later, her communicator pinged and the list arrived. As she scrolled down, her annoyance was replaced by equal parts shock 
an outrage. This ship was more whole than hull. There wasn't a single external panel that wasn't burned, shot away, or rid-lid with lasser fire. The humans had apparently sealed themselves within an inner hull tub and were wearing exosuits for life support. Their engines had just managed the jump to the space dock before the FTL crystals had cracked into a million pieces. Their external docking gear had been completely shot off, which would necessitate a place within the space dock. A spot that was at a definite premium. Arcanis flexed her tentacles. The Confederation space dock couldn't refuse. Not when the humans were forced to wear exosuits. She'd have to clear a space so they could at least leave their ship. Then she'd have that thing junked, and the station chief would have to send the humans back, wherever, on the next transport. One of her tentacles flicked a button and transmitted a response to the ship. Arcanis opened her communication. I've cleared pad 93 for you. Prepare for our tractor beams to engage and guide you in. The channel crackled, and then a somewhat muffled voice responded, If it's all the same to you, we made sure to spare enough deuterium to fly in on our own. Arcanus sighed, scanned the ship again, then spoke. Your ship is in pieces. One wrong move, and you could rip out half the docking ports. There was a pause in response. It is kind of a point of pride for my crew, you see. Arcanus clicked her jaws. Her species knew about the pride of limping your own way home. And if you couldn't limp, you crawled. She began to wonder if the humans weren't as much of a joke as she had always heard. She sent a reply that she approved of the request. Then, with growing interest, she left her office to make her way to Pad 93. She wanted to meet these silly humans who had a sense of pride that was so clearly close to her own species. As the human ship landed, the one remaining stabilizer creaked and then snapped off with an echoing bang. Arcanis flinched slightly at the sound. She only had to wait a few moments before the crew of five was able to exit having partly sheared the door off. They had at least been able to finally remove the helmets from their exosuits. What happened? Did an Eshar ship stumble onto you? Arcanis asked. One of the shorter humans, the one with darker hair, laughed. I guess you could say that. What you are requesting from our stores is a large amount of hardware, weapons, and work. That is a large request when we have battle cruisers in need of repairs and refit. The tall woman nodded, understanding. If you could just get us back into flying shape, we could make our way back to a human sector and handle the rest of the repairs. Arcanis felt that grudging admiration again, but before she could say anything, they were interrupted by the arrival of a GC fleet officer. Arcanis inwardly groaned. During times of peace, she didn't have to deal with these arrogant asses, and she much preferred it that way. Your heap is taking up valuable space. Docking Master, remove this scrap as soon as possible. The Creelians have a star dreadnought in need of immediate repair. Arcanis had seen the work order for the star dreadnought. The Admiral in charge wanted to retrofit a storage bay into an arboretum for his mistress. In spite of this, the Creelians were the military heavyweights of the Confederation. But it still stuck in her craw. The easy smiles of the humans were all gone now. What did you call my baby? One of the other men demanded. The tall woman of the group put a restraining hand on his arm. Your fleet? She asked. The fleet officer looked like he was being talked to by something particularly disgusting. Yes. She held out a data chip. Here's a copy of our combat report for fleet intelligence. The officer gingerly and grudgingly took it before turning around and marching off. The tall woman now looked warily at Arcanus. Arcanus had been examining the hull of the ship. This hull must be at least fifty years old, she exclaimed. Yes, an excursory McTun served as the frame, the tall woman replied. Ah, that takes me back to my hatchling days. Those ships could run on backwaiter rotgut and with half their systems out. The smile slowly returned to the face of the tall woman. Yes, she certainly has proven her worth beyond measure. I wasn't sure we could have taken down those three Escher cruisers and gotten away with our hides intact. Arcanis spluttered. Three? Three cruisers? But what? But how? 
Several of the humans now seemed to be almost laughing. They all slowly made their way over to the edge of the pad to sit down. Well, you know these old excursories were built around a mass driver for pushing asteroids into new orbits? Arcanis nodded. It wasn't glorious work, which is why crews worked with these tubs back in the day. Well, we reworked the mass driver into an autocannon that accelerates projectiles to shortly before the speed of light. The tall woman threw out the information as if saying she had just walked down the corridor to purchase a snack. Then we put some weapons hardpoints onto the hull, whatever we have on hand, and you have a very tough and passable gunship. We call these things Warthogs After. Where did we get the name from, Brisby? The man who had been defensive about the ship replied, Some flying animal from Old Earth, I think. The woman shrugged and nodded. But three Eshar cruisers? We had been sent to patrol some nowhere sector when we picked up three Eshar ships on long-range scanners. No one else was in the area. My people were itching for a bit of revenge after Polarnus III, so we went at it. Of course, waiting around in a half-destroyed ship until one's patrol relief comes wasn't much fun. Arcanis nodded. Polarnus III had been a tragedy for humanity. It was one of their breadbasket planets, and supposedly safe behind GC lines, and therefore had little in the way of military protection. But somehow, twelve Eshar ships had appeared out of nowhere, glassed the planet terminates 150 million, and then disappeared again. Wait a minute. You destroyed three cruisers, lost half your ship, and still waited around until you were relieved? Arcanus couldn't believe her hearing stalks. Well, we had a couple of autocannon rounds left, one of the other men joked. Arcanus pulled out her work tablet, tapped twice. The warthog was now at the top of the repair list. Fleet would throw a fit, but if they were to watch the data chip, then maybe they'd change their mind. Arcanis certainly had. Fleet Officer Sickless sighed, ran a hand over his thorax and stared at the data stick. It lay on his desk as if taunting him. He knew he would have to view it, write a report, and send it up the chain of command. That was the entirety of his job, but not what he had joined up for. He wanted to start out as a targeting officer on one of the plasma lance cannons, just raining indiscriminate destruction down onto a planet's surface from high orbit. Or maybe, in his wilder dreams, a fighter pilot. Instead, he was colorblind. He could barely see above 800 nanometers in wavelength. So, he got shunted off into administration. He wasn't sure what secondhand embarrassment was waiting for him on the data stick, but he knew he needed a strong drink before he watched the human report on the stick. Five minutes later, and a large glass of straight me elk in the hand, Sickless accessed the data stick. Half an hour later, his drink was still untouched. Fleet Station Commodore Celis's communicator pinged. She sighed. She wasn't in charge of the station itself, just everything having to do with the fleet on the station. Still, that was more than enough. Then she saw the name on the communicator. Third Sub-Lieutenant Sickless. What does that little pissant want now? She groaned. Acrelian munitions barge probably docked three centimeters off-center from their landing pad, and he wants to requisition a squad to measure the deleterious effects on our orbit, her secretary Terrell said. Donkey, she muttered. Why haven't we replaced him with an AI yet and sent him off to waste reclamation? You owe Commander Frankel 350 credits from your last game of Setnak. Also, he conveniently looked the other way the last time you reclamated 2nd Sub-Lieutenant Scherf's stack of data sticks. You know they clogged up the physical waste recycler unit for 30 hours. Oh no, don't even remind me of that self-important scrotal hair counter. Cecelis paused, getting a bit suspicious. What did happen to him, though? I believe you informed him that you had a standing order to space him if you ever saw him again. Cecelis pondered. I don't suppose I can give the same standing order for the third sub-lieutenant, can I? I'm afraid the Fleet Station's council can only look the other way when it comes to the occasional. Spacing. Besides, ma'am, we all know you can come up with something far more creative. Sellies smirked. Stars. She hated being stuck in a glorified chop shop and recycler, 
especially when she was saddled with so many bad-for-brains junior officers. Unfortunately, Fleet Dreadnought Command had taken a poor view of her maneuvers at the Battle of Rosk ten years ago. They had won her the battle, but they weren't traditional. Man barrels wouldn't know creativity if it bit them in their collective. Fine. We have to at least let him have his say. She rummaged around in her desk, pulled out her sidearm, checked to make sure it was loaded and the safety was off, then set it down on top of her desk where the red danger light was clearly visible. Is that for us? Or him? Terrell asked. Maybe first him, then us. It might be the only way we'll ever escape this heap of an assignment. Third Sub-Lieutenant Cyclus entered the room. The data stick clutched tightly in his hand, saw the sidearm on the desk, and paused. He swallowed nervously. Fleet Commodore Sellys grinned, showing the tips of her two vestigial fangs. Fleet Commodore, Ma'am Cyclus stuttered out. We have a new data stick from a human ship that just came and docked. Sellys groaned inwardly. It wouldn't surprise her if this Cyclus actually needed help finding his own asshole. It was certainly beneath her duties to give a about any random ship coming into the station, and especially some human ship. She stroked the top of the sidearm with her fingertips and bared her fangs a bit more. I thought you should see it, sorry, Commodore. Bye. Cyclus spoke as quickly as he could, dropped the stick on her desk, and bolted. Selly has raised an eye hood. That might be a record. Thirty seconds from coming in to leaving, Terrell agreed. Please make sure my sidearm remains in working order. Selly's put the safety back on and replaced it in her desk. What should we do with that? Terrell motioned to the stick. Selly's sighed. Look over it, I suppose. On the off chance, the extremely off chance, that it's anything worth my attention, let me know. Otherwise dump it in the reclamator. Just to remind Frankel who's in charge of this heap. Two minutes later, Terrell called Commodore Sellies into her office. Thirty minutes later, Sellies called a meeting of the command officers. As soon as possible. Forty minutes later, the senior department officers had gathered in the main meeting room. All right, you brain-dead assholes, you need to watch this. The Commodore popped the data stick into the viewer. The scene showed a small and clearly old human ship on an intercept course with three Escher cruisers. Some of the officers started chuckling. A few of them started talking about how they were here to have a few laughs before getting back to work. Then the first Escher cruiser was... Well, it was shredded on the video. There was no other way to describe it. The cruiser had only managed to get one wild shot off before their ship became flying scraps. Over the next 20 minutes, they watched as the little human ship slugged it out with two Eshar cruisers simultaneously. When the video was over, the silence in the room was heavy. Did. Did that little old bucket of rust and scrap just take down three Eshar cruisers? Captain Pelkis asked. It would seem so, Commodore Selly said wearily. Well, I suppose even the most basic of species has to get lucky sometime, Commander Frankel said. The fleet intelligence officer Mulis was laughing. This shocked the assembled officers into a new silence. Mulis rarely spoke. During their regular meetings, he delivered his reports with a minimum of words, and that was it. He never cracked a smile even though his race was well known for their refined sense of humor. He certainly never laughed. If he had friends, they would have claimed he was incapable of laughing. The rest of you really have no idea about humans, do you? Mulis asked. Everyone looked uncomfortable. Well, they're not very highly developed. Frankel began. Mulis waved his comment aside. In the Lovak conflict, human ships accounted for 73% of enemy casualties. What? Frankel spluttered. But, but they're not even really in the fleet. Yes, as they took part in various conflicts from the beginning of their time in the GC, it became clear that we were all better served by letting them do their own thing. What the bad kind of fleet idea is that? Sellies asked. Not a single one of those limp dicks up there has ever had a creative idea since suckling their mother's royal jelly. If they did, I'd still be blasting the tits off Eshar assholes in a dreadnought. Mulis smirked. Look, 
Humanity first took part on the side of GC forces during the succession crisis. They weaponized the planet of Frio. Frankel looked puzzled. So, they put defenses in orbit over a useless planet? It didn't help. The planet was destroyed. No, Mulis said. You misunderstand me. They weaponized Frio. They turned the entire planet into one massive weapon. The stunned silence at this pronouncement lasted a moment. How? How the bad did they turn an entire gas giant into a weapon? Sellies asked, stunned. Our best scientists still don't know, Mulis replied. Frio took out three quarters of the succession fleet, but fleet just sends humans off to unimportant places. Well, no. Fleet actually sends humans off to classified places. Well, guys, if you liked this video and want a particular HFY story, comment below with its title. Also, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell and like the video. But most important, leave a comment. Until the next video.